And uh, welcome to Hallmark. It's good to see you. If you're here in person, thank you for driving in. I know the, uh, the white stuff is falling. And uh, I know if you're like me, you hope for a little accumulation, at least on your grass. I mean, give us something, right? It seldom snows in Texas, so make it count. But thank you for being here. You're an encouragement to me when you show up in person. And I can see you face to face as part of my faith family. But you're also an encouragement to us when you join us online from the comfort of home, and I know many of you are still doing that, so thank you for being here today. My name's Dave Winger. I serve as the associate pastor here at Hallmark. It's my privilege to bring to you God's word today. Our pastor, John Haley, is in Kenya, Africa, for the next two weeks, ministering with Real for Christ with our missionaries, David and Kim Hayes. So please be in prayer for them, that they would have a fruitful and safe trip. Um, but let's take our Bibles today and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that this is week two in our hope series. Um, hope is an acrostic that stands for a healthy optimism from a promised eternity. And I think that we could use a little hope in 2021. Amen? Amen. And so it's my task to you today to bring the message, Jesus is the hope of the church. Pastor John talked about how Jesus is the hope for the world last week, and we're going to hear another great message in our hope series next week from uh, Chris Kirkendall, a good friend of ours here at Hallmark. Uh, but as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 5, I just want to tell you how much I love the local church. I'm 47 years old, and for every year of my life, I've been in or around the local church. My dad was a pastor. My mom was active in his ministry. She played the piano. In fact, I remember as a little boy sitting on the front row, the pew on the front, uh, because I sat with my mom and she had to get to the piano quickly, but I remember sitting there and her giving me offering envelopes to color on at an early age. I would ask her for some Tums because I thought they were candy from her purse, and she would give me Tums during church and, and gum and just tell me to keep quiet. And I remember falling asleep on numerous occasions as my dad preached. That has nothing to do with my dad's preaching. It had everything to do with my age, but I would fall asleep and lay my head down on my mom's lap and many times she would have to get up and play the piano and so she gently lay my head down in fact one time uh, she tried not to disturb me and she slipped out so she could play the invitational hymn and when church was over she just went back and started talking and greeting with people and everybody gravitated out of the sanctuary into the foyer and they shut the lights off and there I was in the front pew fast asleep and when I woke up the lights were out everybody was gone I thought Jesus had come back the rapture had happened and I had been left behind that will get your attention folks it will get your attention. It will make you check your salvation. Uh, but I grew up in and around the church my whole life. In fact, at one point in my life, our house was attached to the church. We lived in a church parsonage. And so my sister and I, we would, we would goof around in the church all the time. I remember playing in the basement. We would roller skate in the church basement because it wasn't carpeted. It was just cement. And we would play the Bay City Rollers. Is anybody, do you, do you know the Bay City Rollers? They'd sing that song, Saturday Night, Saturday Night. You know who I'm talking about, Bart. Are you with me? No, maybe I'm older than I thought. Uh, but we would be having like a disco dance roller skating party in the church basement Saturday night, and then we'd, you know, we'd have worship on Sunday. But that was my life growing up. I was always involved in church ministries. I remember as a teenager, I would teach the children's uh, church sometimes. Uh, I started leading the music in my dad's church when I was 17 years old. When I went off to college, God called me personally to full-time ministry, and I surrendered my life, and for 25 years, I've served in the local church uh, in Florida and Alabama and Chicago, and then here in this great state of Texas for the last 17 years, and so if you haven't got it yet, I love the local church. I have a master's degree in church ministries. It's, it's what I've been eating and drinking and sleeping my entire life, but did you know that you could be in and around the local church and never be a part of the church? You see, I didn't become a part of the church of Jesus until I was 16 years old. And I realized that I was a sinner and I needed to turn from my sin and repent of my sin and trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It was in that moment that I became part of the church. You can be in and around the church, but it doesn't mean that you're a part of the church. And if you're here this morning and you've been in and around the church, but you're not yet a part of the church because you haven't trusted in Jesus for salvation... I hope you'll do that before the end of our time together. You see, because there is one church, and it's made up of all who believe and receive Jesus. And so as I talk today about the church and how Jesus is the hope of the church, I'm talking about the church universal, all believers in Jesus, but I'm also talking 
about the local church. And here's the difference. You see, the universal church um, is, is everywhere. The church like this is local. The, the, the universal church is spiritual, therefore it's invisible, but the local church is a physical expression of that spiritual reality. And so it's visible. The universal church is made up of only saved people. Only people that have repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus for salvation. But the, the local church, this physical expression, can be made up of saved people and lost people. We do our best uh, to, to figure out if you're saved or not when you come to, to become a member of our local church, this physical expression of a spiritual reality. We ask your testimony. And, but there's some people that slip in, you know. They just say, yeah, I'm saved. And then they come. Or there's some that just attend on Sunday morning. And if you're here and, and that's you, our prayer is that you will become a part of uh, the spiritual church, the universal church. Uh, the universal church is made up of dead and living saints in Christ. Uh, the local church is made up of only the living, of course. The universal church, there's one. All followers of Jesus. The local church, many. And then, of course, there's no denominations in the universal church. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ. But there are many denominations in local churches. You say, well, Dave, man, where do all those denominations come from? Well, they come from us disagreeing about non-essential things. You see, there are some essential things that we must agree on if we're going to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. All of those who are part of the church of Jesus Christ, that one universal body of believers, they must believe in the deity of Christ. They must believe that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, that no man comes to the Father except through him, in fact, anything having to do with the salvation of the soul, they have to agree on that. That's why in theological circles we say in essential doctrines, unity. If there's someone that says that Jesus isn't the only way, that he's not the only truth, then they're not a part of that church. Okay, Just because they call themselves church, just because they name the name Christ, if they're saying Jesus plus anything equals salvation, or Jesus minus anything, or anything other than Jesus equals salvation, they're not a part of that universal church. So in essential things, unity, but then there's some non-essential things. Things like church structure and organization and what we believe about the mode of baptism. Those, those we would say are non-essential. Your salvation doesn't hinge on those things. So we hold those things loosely and we say in non-essential things, liberty. But in all things, charity. Amen? So if you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, you believe that he is the only way to heaven, And if you've put your faith and trust in him, you are a part of the church. In the front of our building, it says Hallmark Baptist Church, but that's just a designation of where Hallmark Baptist Church meets. You are Hallmark Baptist Church. Hallmark Baptist Church walked through the doors, tuned in online today. You came into this address and you sat down and you lifted up the name of your Savior, Jesus Christ. You our Hallmark Baptist Church, a physical expression of a spiritual reality. So as a part of the church, I want to remind you today that no matter what's going on with pandemics and quarantines and closings, that we can know that we have hope in the church because Jesus is the hope of the church. Don't be discouraged. We had a lot of people asking when the lockdown occurred and we couldn't meet in person, What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to the church? And I could say with confidence, the church is going to be just fine. Do you know why I can say that? Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we're going to learn three things from Ephesians 5 today that will hopefully encourage you to realize that Jesus is is the hope of the church. So if you've turned in your Bibles there today, I want you to notice that as we read through this passage, some of you are saying, Dave, why are you turning to a passage of Scripture that talks about marriage uh, for a message on the church? Well, I'll tell you why. And as we read through this, I'm going to emphasize certain portions of each verse to show you that this passage is what Paul said in verse 32, Ephesians 5, 32. He says that this portion of scripture, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning, what, a husband and wife? No, he said, I speak concerning Christ and the church. The purpose of this passage, while it is used frequently to encourage husbands in their role in marriage and wives in their role in marriage, I do that when I 
have the privilege to officiate a wedding. I use Ephesians 5 to challenge the bride, to challenge the groom. But the purpose of this paragraph, this passage, is to really show us the mystery of Christ and the church. We so often use the church to inform marriage, but we, Paul's intent, as directed by the Holy Spirit, was to use marriage to inform us about the church. And so we're going to see that Jesus is the hope of the church here in Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. He says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife also. But look at this. As also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So again, three reasons why we can have hope for the church. The first reason is this, Jesus is the head of the church because he leads us. In verses 23 and 24, if you would just read the portion about the church, it says Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. And then in verse 24, the church is subject to Christ. Jesus is the head of the church because he leads us. Now, in the almost 75 years of Hallmark's history, we've had some great godly leaders. Would you agree? I mean, you haven't been around for 75 years. Very few of you have. But for those that you know, you would say God has blessed this local body of believers with some great leadership. We have a great pastor now. Our pastor is a great man, a godly man of character who has a heart for you. He loves you, and he wants to lead you according to God's will. But Pastor John is not the head of the church. Neither have any of the other pastors been the head of the church, nor any pastors that are to come. Will, they, they will not be the head of the church. The head of the church, globally and locally, is Jesus Christ. He's the head. He's the leader. And the church is subject to him. That's why it's so very important that we love Jesus here, that we follow Jesus here, that we lift Jesus up here, because he's the head of our church and we are subject to him. And if this local church ever stops following the head of the church, he will come and remove our light from this community. If we are unfaithful, if we are unfruitful, the head of the church who leads us will come and he will say, I'm going to take the light from you. As he said to some of the churches in Revelation. It's good to look at human leadership and and, and as they say, follow me as I follow Christ, but we should never make them the head of the church. We should never place them on a pedestal because men will always disappoint you. Why? Because they're just men. And even the best of men are men at best. But Jesus, as the head, as the leader, will never disappoint you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never misguide you. And so we're to love him and we're to obey him and submit to him and follow him and in turn, accomplish his mission that he's given us as his church. We should be fruitful. We should be faithful. And he's such a good leader, Jesus is. And so pastors and leaders, we're, we're not the chief shepherd. We're under shepherds. We're just qualified Christians who say, follow me as I follow Christ, and we have been charged to equip you to do the work of the ministry and to fulfill the mission of the church. But Jesus is the head of the church. That's what the Bible says. The church is subject to him. So he's the hope of the church because he leads us. You know, it has been difficult to lead through this, uh, through the circumstances of the pandemic. And we've sought the Lord. Should, you know, when should we open back up? When, how should we do this? And, and we're trusting that we get it right. But there's not all the time where we're going to get it right. There's going to be some times where we get it wrong. But Jesus never gets it wrong. 
And so we're leaning on him, and we're seeking his face, and we're asking for his wisdom as he guides us, for he is the head of the church. He leads us. But the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the heart of the church as he loves us. Look at verses 25 and 26. It says that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So Christ is not only the head of the church as he leads us, he's the heart of the church as he loves us. He loves us and he gave himself for us. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you need a reminder of how much Christ loves the church, remember the cross. He demonstrated his love on the cross. He laid his life down for his imperfect bride, knowing that one day she would belong to him. He gave himself sacrificially for us. We're the love of his life, basically. The love of his life. And so not only does he lead us, but we subject ourselves to him because of his great love for us. We sang about it this morning. He loves us so much. We get lost in his love. We write songs about his love and we sing about his love. Not just about him, but we sing love songs to him. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If ever I've loved you, my Jesus, it's, it's now. Maybe you're more of a how sweet it is to be loved by you, Jesus, you know, type style of worshiper. I don't know, but, but we sing songs of love about him and to him because of his great love for us. And it was demonstrated on the cross, and then it was communicated through his word. Did you know that this Bible that you hold in your hand or is on your phone is a love letter from a groom to his bride? It's for us. He's given us a love letter. Everything he wants us to know about him and about what he's promised us is right here in his word. You want to know God's will? God's will is found in God's word. Open it up and you'll read a love letter from him to you. We love him because he first loved us and he gave himself for us. That's amazing love. Greater love has no man than this. The man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says, I call you friends. The church is not a building. The church is his body. It's his, it's his bride and he loves us with an unfailing love. That's how I know that everything's going to be okay. That's how I know that we can have hope because not only does he lead us through whatever trial we face, he loves us. We love to be led by people that love us the most and want the best for us. That's a word to teenagers, by the way. Your parents love you the most. They want what's best for you. But Jesus is a groom that is passionately in love with his bride. He demonstrated it on the cross. He communicated it through his word and he confirmed it by his Holy Spirit. Turn back to John chapter 14, if you, if you don't mind. In John chapter 14. This is a great passage in the Gospel of John because Jesus is telling his disciples that soon he must go away. But he's not going to leave them without a comforter. He's not going to leave them on their own. He cares too much for them. And so he's going to ensure that they're cared for. He's going to ensure that they're helped. And in verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come for you. Jesus loves us so much that he cared for his bride. He says, I'm going to go away. And the reason I'm going away is I'm preparing a place for you, and I will come again, but until I come again, I'm going to entrust you to the Holy Spirit. He will comfort you, he will help you, he will guide you into all truth. I'm going to take care of you. And so Jesus, our leader, the head of the church, he's the heart of the church, he loves us, and he demonstrated it on the cross, he communicated it in his word, and he confirmed it by the Holy Spirit. But there's a third reason that, that we can be encouraged this morning, and it's that Jesus is the hope of the church because he's returning for us one day. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, 
verse 27, that he, Jesus, might present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus comes and he gives himself for the church so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life and be a part of his bride, his body. And one day, one day he's coming again to receive the church to himself. And we are to be washed in his word. We are to be pure. We are to be holy. We are to be dressed and ready to go to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's coming again for us. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 1 through 3, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. My bride, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'll receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming for his bride. And we should anticipate that. We should look forward to that. I love how Pastor John told us the tradition of the Jewish families in that period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. For 400 years, they were told that Elijah was going to come and prepare the way for their Messiah. And so they would anticipate the coming of Elijah by setting an empty place setting at the table every night for their meal. And that empty place setting was to remind them that Elijah could come at any time and they anticipated his coming. And the little kids would even go and check the door. It's today the day he's coming, and they look outside to see. I love that picture of the bride's anticipation of the groom's return. Ladies, were you excited the week of your wedding? Were you excited? You're probably more busy than excited, let's be honest. But you anticipated seeing the groom. You anticipated that moment of being united forever. Well, did you know that Jesus anticipates his return like we do? You see, we're excited to see Jesus face to face. He's excited to see his bride, who is pure and holy, who's been washed by the water of the word and cleansed by the Holy Spirit, who is sanctified and ready to meet and spend eternity with him. He's anticipating the day. He's excited about it. Isn't that encouraging that Jesus is almost just as excited to see us as we are to see him face to face? He's looking forward to coming and receiving us to himself because he wants to show us the place he's been preparing for us. Back in uh, college, I met my wife our senior year, and we started dating in October, and I proposed soon after that, and we were to graduate that summer and uh, get married, and we were pretty pumped and excited about that. I don't advise short engagements. Everyone I counsel, I say, hey, be with them for four seasons, you know, let's see what they're really like. But I didn't take my own advice. I just knew, and she just knew, if you can believe that. And we were excited about it. We we're excited about getting married. Well, it worked out that I was called to serve at a church in Jacksonville, Florida, two months before we were to be married. And so I left Lynchburg, Virginia, went down to Jacksonville, secured a place to live, and started serving there as a youth music guy at East Point Baptist Church. And my wife, Dawn, was in Lynchburg. She was preparing for our wedding. We were going to be married in Lynchburg. And that was a long two months. I'll just be honest with you. We were separated. I couldn't see her. We didn't have anything like FaceTime. Uh, cell phones were archaic and primitive back in the day. And so it was tough. It was a tough two months. But I got to tell you, when I flew back to Lynchburg and landed in the airport a couple days before the wedding, and I got my bags, and I knew she was picking me up in the airport. I was walking through the airport, looking past everyone that was walking by and milling around. I was looking beyond their heads. I was looking past everything. It's a wonder I didn't crash into anyone because I had one thing on my mind. I wanted to see my bride because she was radiant and beautiful, and I knew she was waiting for me. And she was pure and and ready and just, I mean, I could go on and on. She's going to be mad at me if I, if I do, but I could think of nothing else but my bride because I was so anticipating us spending the rest of our lives together. We were going to be together forever. And so I floated through the airport, you know. 
until I saw dawn. It was, I was, and I didn't think about much else. The wedding was a blur, honestly. But I was so ready to meet my bride and to be with my bride. And Jesus wants to be with his bride. He loves us. He leads us. He's gone to prepare a beautiful place for us, and he wants to show us what he's done, what he's finished for you. You say, well, I don't feel worthy. You don't, you're, not, you're not worthy. You never will be worthy. But he demonstrated how much he loved you by dying on the cross for you anyway, while you were still in sin. He's redeemed you. You're forgiven. You're saved. Now you're being sanctified. Don't worry about it. You will be ready when the moment comes. He'll glorify you in a moment. And we'll be with him forever. Aren't you encouraged by that promise? One of our, uh, one of our board members is experiencing that today. Mike Manier passed from this earth into the presence of Jesus last night at 9.30. And he stepped from this cruel world into the glorious presence of his Lord the one who loved him, gave himself for him. He's been comforting Mike his entire life and sanctifying Mike his entire life and preparing him for this moment where he would step into eternity. And the first thing Jesus did was, wait till you see what I've built for you. Mike spent the latter part of his life building churches for people in Haiti, preparing places for them. And now he gets to see the place that Jesus prepared for him what a day, what a day that was. And we mourn with Vicki and the family and we pray for her and we'll surround her with love as her faith family. But man, we rejoice for Mike because he finally sees Jesus face to face, the one who's led him, the one who has loved him and the one who came for him and said, Mike, it's time, let's go home. And he's in the presence of God. We all share that hope no matter what we face, no matter what problems we have, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know in my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the promise we have. Jesus is the hope of the church. He's the hope that, that we can lean on. He's the hope that we can find courage in. He leads us, he loves us, and he's coming for us. Titus 2, verses 11 through 15 has been one of my favorite passages. It says, For the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And then this verse says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort Rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. We're to be looking for Jesus, living in a way that pleases him, following his leadership, singing about his love, reveling in his love, but looking always for his imminent return. Will you stand with me this morning? As Mike and the band come this morning, I'm going to challenge you that if you're here this morning, and maybe you've been in and around the church your entire life. Maybe you're like me, you're a church kid. But the Holy Spirit has made it clear in your heart that you are not a part of the church. That There's never been a time in your life where you've repented of your sin. You've turned from your sin and self-effort and said, Jesus, I need your grace. I need you to forgive me. I need you to save me. If you've never done that, you can do that this morning right here. It's as simple as saying, God, have mercy on me. I know I'm a sinner, and I turn from my sin, and I trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross for me. I want to be a part of your church. Lord, save me. If you pray that from your heart, he will save you. And if you made that decision this morning, as we sing, 
as you trust Christ for salvation, let us know. You can text the word SAVED to the number on the screen. If you're watching online, you can put in the comments SAVED or text the number there. We would love to celebrate with you. We want to welcome you in to our faith family. We're all just a bunch of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. We're just trying to figure it out. We're trying to submit to, to Christ as he leads us. But we know that one day we'll see him. We'll be reunited with him. And we look forward to it. We would love to celebrate that decision with you today. Let's pray. And then as we sing, if you need to trust Christ, do that today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise that we stand on. Lord, we can have a healthy optimism from a promised eternity because of your love letters. And we thank you for that today. We thank you that, that you love us and, and that through trying times and confusing times, we can lean on you to lead us. But Lord, we celebrate the fact that one day you're coming for us. And we want to be ready. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.